Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our office in Sierra US in Washington. I would like to give you a brief summary of September 2022 uprising. And my colleague, Mr. Jafar Zadeh, later will share with you some of the new information that we got from inside Iran. The uprising that erupted in September 2022 was a remarkable event in Iran's modern history. Triggered by the dreadful killing of 22-year-old Mahsa Amini, the movement quickly expanded its focus beyond the government's oppressive treatment of women, evolving into a broad-based call for regime change that engulfed 282 cities, all of Iran's provinces. According to the main opposition, the People's Mujahideen Organization of Iran, PMOI, MEK, over 750 people lost their lives and more than 30,000 were arrested during the protests. Despite the government's efforts to control information by shutting down the internet, real-time updates allowed the world to witness the extent of the protests and the brutality of the regime's response. Ali Khamenei, the supreme leader, as well as many regime's officials, many times felt compelled to publicly acknowledge the role of the MEK PMOI affiliated resistance units in their speeches about the role they played in the resistance and the uprising, thereby confirming the regime's concern about the growing influence of organized opposition, MEK, among the younger generations. Women and Generation Z were at the forefront, infusing the movement with stamina and determination. It's crucial to understand that the women's political participation in 2022 uprising was not spontaneous. It was the result of 40 years of organized resistance against the regime, misogynist policies, a struggle in which women have played a leading role for more than three decades, from underground activism to leadership roles. In the PMI MEK, the Iranian women have been preparing for this movement for so many long time. They were not just challenging the immediate atrocities, but also the deeply embedded main religious controlled system. Women became both the face and the driving force of a resistance aiming at social, political, and cultural transformation. Perhaps the most telling element of this uprising were its slogans. Protesters chanted, death to Khamenei, no monarchy, no supreme leader, capturing the essence of their broader frustration with authoritarian rule, irrespective of its ideological cloak. Their demand was a democratic republic, a multi-party system, a modern judiciary system, rooted in the principle of 10-point plan of Mrs. Maryam Rajavi, uh, president-elect of the National Council of Resistance of Iran, NCRI. Aggravating the turmoil were Iran's dismal economic conditions, a 50% surge in the cost of living, coupled with a plummeting currency and soaring food prices. Economic hardship thus acted as a catalyst rather than a separate issue. The regime found itself in an increasingly untenable position, not only politically, but also economically. In summary, the 2022 Iran uprising posed a direct challenge to the legitimacy of a four-decade theocratic regime. Its scale stretching across demographics and social strata was remarkable. Their slogans made it clear that the fight was 
against authoritarian rule itself, irrespective of its ideological cloak and basis. And the role of women revealed a resistance that was neither sporadic nor momentarily, but a calculated culmination of years of sacrifice and struggle. So the uprising has already left a permanent mark on Iran's socio-political landscape, the ramifications of which will undoubtedly vibrate for years to come. With well over 750 lives lost and countless more imprisoned and tortured, the stakes couldn't be higher, but neither could the hope for a new Iran. It was again such a background and a determined nation with 40 plus years of organized resistance that Tehran employed all of its repressive forces and allocated as much as money and resources to crush the movement to no avail. I now ask my colleague, Mr. Jafar Zadeh, to share with you the new information that we got from inside Iran, the extensive effort that Iranian regime is trying to suppress the uprising, but to no avail until now. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Samsami. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our office, the National Council of Presidents of Iran, U.S. Representative Office. My name is Ayrza Jafarzadeh, and I'm the Deputy Director of the Washington Office of the uh, NCRI. As uh, you just heard from uh, Ms. Samsami about the overview of the uprising, what actually happened over the past one year, what's ahead of us, and how the uprising has left, as she said, a permanent mark. Um, and in, in that context, what I want to do, I want to share with you um, very um, detailed information that we have obtained uh, from our sources inside the country, but also other sources have come from inside Iran uh, that shows the role of the uh, uh, Revolutionary Guards in suppressing the uprising, but also their effort to prevent the resurgence of the um, uprising. Um, uh, just ahead of the um, anniversary of the September 2022 uprising. So let's um, get to the um, details of the uh, information we have. But before that, I want to remind everyone, because this uh, event is both in person, as some journalists are here, but also it's broadcast live on our social media platforms, on our website. Those journalists who are watching the event um, virtually you can pose your questions to, by emailing them to media at ncrius.org. I repeat, media at ncrius.org. We'll get your questions and we'll present it uh, when the Q&A session comes after, right after I'm done with my uh, original presentation. So let's get to um, the source. As I mentioned earlier, the source is actually the network inside Iran of the uh, Mujahideen the, uh, the, uh, the also known as the MEK or the PMOI, and um, relying on the social network that they have uh, inside the country. Now, uh, let's look at the, um, you know, the strategy of the regime to uh, prevent the resurgence of the uprising, because since day one when the protests started, especially in the backdrop of all the previous protests that we have had uh, before, their goal was to um, first suppress it and second, prevent the resurgence of the uh, uprising. And in that uh, context, they have drastically increased the budget um, of various repressive agencies offering financial rewards and uh, privilege to prevent uh, desertion of the uh, security forces. And I'll get into the detail uh, of this. And of course, um, in order to do that, the decision, as always, comes from the um, the, the, the top, the Supreme Leader Khamenei, which appointed the, uh, the issue to the Supreme National Security Council, which is the highest decision-making body within the regime, presided by the um, head of the executive branch, that's the Ibrahim Raisi, the regime's president, 
and also implemented by the IRGC. And that's the part especially that we want to focus on uh, today uh, because I don't think uh, there has been a complete picture of what the role of the IRGC has been over the years, but especially uh, since the September 2022 uh, uprising. Um, here's the, uh, the hierarchy of the Revolutionary Guards, their operations all over the country. But let's start from the top, the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei. This is the chart that was put together uh, by our movement, um, compiling information from various sources, identifying the relationships, and figuring out how the whole structure actually uh, operates. Um, now, the Supreme National Security Council, which I mentioned earlier, uh, is presided over by the head of the executive branch, that's the uh, Ibrahim Raisi. Then you have the heads of uh, the other two branches, um, the, uh, uh, the uh, judiciary branch, uh, you have Ghulam um, Hussein Ejei, you have the legislative branch, Mohammad Baghir Ghalibaf, and the secretary of the uh, uh, Supreme National Security Council is Ali Shamkhani, uh, one of the top brass Revolutionary Guard commanders since day one. And then um, you have the uh, chief of staff of the armed Force of forces, Mohammad Baghiri. His background is IRGC. Uh, the foreign minister, um, Hossein Amir Abdullahian, again, IRGC background. MIS um, uh, chief, uh, Ismail Khatib, Mullah. Uh, the minister of interior is Ahmad Mahidi. Um, he was the very first commander of the Quds Force, which is tasked with uh, what they call extraterritorial activities, meaning terrorism. Uh, he was the first commander of the Quds Force. He's now uh, he's been a veteran member of the Revolutionary Guards. He's now the head, the Minister of Interior, as part of the Supreme National Security Council. And then you have the uh, commander in chief of the IRGC, Hossein Salami, and then um, uh, the Army Chief of Staff, um, Abdul Rahman um, Musabi, and the Minister of Defense, Qarayi uh, Ashtani. Now, um, under that is actually the IRGC's own uh, Supreme Command Council. Uh, that's the council that oversees all of the activities of the operations of the IRGC. Task is basically suppression of the people and the uprisings. Uh, you have the head of all, the commander in chief of the Revolutionary Guards, of course, is uh, Hossein Salami, then uh, his deputy, Ali Fadavi, and then uh, you have the uh, commanders of uh, the other four forces of the IRGC that's the Quds Force, the Ground Forces, the Navy, and the Aerospace Force, plus the commander of the Besiege, which used to be a part of the IRGC. Uh, but is now operating under the command of the IRGC after they upgraded their, their facilities and the resources. And then the head of the IRGC intelligence, which is uh, Mohammad Kazemi. So that constitutes the IRGC Supreme Command Council, which when it comes to the uprising, they have been in charge of overseeing how they actually uh, want to suppress the, the protests uh, all over the country, but, uh, but also specifically preventing uh, the resurgence of it. Now, one area that I want to focus on uh, is that since a few years ago, after the 2017 uprisings, the, um, the structure of the Revolutionary Guards changed. Uh, now, now they have the command of each province, uh, 30 provinces plus the Tehran itself, that makes it 31 provinces in the country. Um, and let's look at the Tehran situation because that's where the bulk of the activities were, were shaping up. Um, there is a, a base called Sara Lah Base, um, which is the, uh, uh, actually the command for the suppression of all the uh, activities, uh, uh, you know, when it comes to protests, to any kind of dissent uh, in the city. Um, especially the, during the red alert situation, the commander of the um, uh, Sara Lah Base becomes the IRGC commander, that's Hossein Salami. So he takes over as a commander of the Sarala base, and everything comes under his command. Um, but, but the important thing is actually what's under the Sarala base. Um, uh, let's, let's take a closer look at that um, right here. That's the Sarala base here. As I mentioned, the IRGC Major General Hussein Salami is commanding it. Then you have the um, representative of the MIS, um, 
and the, the head of the, the commander of the Tehran uh, uh, State Security Forces. And then you have the commander of Sayyid al-Shuhada Corps, uh, which is in charge of the uh, uh, Tehran province suppression. Then you have the commander of Muhammad Rasulullah Corps, uh, Muhammad, or also known as Muhammad Corps, which is in charge of the suppression of the greater Tehran and only focus on Tehran. Then you have the judiciary and then the representative of the, uh, uh, the interior ministry, uh, which on the regular circumstances, uh, state security forces are under the command of the uh, interior minister. But under red, red alert situation, all of them, including the interior minister, they all come under the command of the Sarah Allah base. Now, the uh, Mohammed uh, Corps, um, which as I said is in charge of the um, uh, suppression of protests in Greater Tehran, they have divided the city in four different areas, just like Washington, D.C. And, you know, you have the um, northwest, um, you have the southwest, uh, northeast, and southeast Tehran. And each of those four um, have their own base uh, appointed to them. Uh, the FAT uh, base is actually dealing with southwest of Tehran. The Quds base, northwest of Tehran. Nasr base, northeast Tehran. And Ghad base um, in southeast uh, Tehran. So when we are talking about the, the protest, uh, the uprising, specifically since September of last year, the entire operation was run um, by the Sarah Allah base when it came to Tehran. And then equivalent to this, they have the same situation in each province. As I mentioned earlier, uh, they have RGC command in 30 provinces. So in each province, you have the commander of the Revolution Guards in that province taking over, controlling even the governor, everybody else go under the, the, the command of that. Now, um, having said that, let's, let's just take a look at the role of the IRGC specifically. Um, uh, clearly, because of the fear of the overthrow, uh, the IRGC was basically dominating the role. And uh, when we looked at the, the whole situation, we um, uh, realized that their role has been even much greater than we even thought in the beginning. And um, they have actually employed their own uh, combat forces in addition to the controlling uh, things, but dispatching their own forces on the ground uh, to confront the, the, uh, the, the protests. Um, now, uh, and I'm going to take a look at some of the uh, documents that we obtained from inside the the Iran regime, and we're revealing them here for the first time. Um, here is one of this document um, that is um, signed by the Brigadier General of the IRGC, Hassan Hassan Zadeh. He is the commander of the uh, Mohammed uh, Corps, and it's marked uh, top secret and uh, very urgent, as you can see on the, on the top. And they um, basically, um, the date of the uh, document is uh, November 2nd, 2022. This is the height of the uprising, and that's when the directive comes. Now, in this uh, uh, directive, uh, basically, um, the, um, it, 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 it says, it has, as you can see, it has 14 items um, here, giving lots of details, uh, defining what the goal is, uh, saying that uh, the goal is to prevent unrest and operations such as writing graffiti on the walls and to arrest the activists who write the gravity, uh, the, the graffiti. And then um, it, it talks about the operational divisions uh, that uh, need to be uh, sent to the area. It defines like what time each of them would go, which areas uh, they would um, uh, be assigned, what kind of surveillance they would have. They even name um, each uh, battalion or division uh, and what they actually have uh, to do. And then um, saying, you know, specific dates, you know, all of the details of the activities are defined, all of them with the intention of crushing um, any activities by the, uh, by the uh, protesters at the, uh, at the uprising. Um, now, the, uh, <clears throat> uh, this is another one. The date, um, uh, this one is actually, um, uh, 
uh, four, uh, two days later, that's November 4, uh, 2022. Again, it's top secret as it marked uh, up there. And uh, basically, um, it talks about, for instance, the, um, uh, the uh, division, operational division um, of the IRGC uh, with the capacity of uh, four um, uh, uh, battalions. Uh, and they detail what kind of motorized vehicles are going to be there, what kind of uh, special forces are going to be there, what kind of actually weapons they should have with them. All of the details are, 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 are assigned. Uh, they even have uh, which uh, organization is assigned to e each cross-section of, of Tehran, which are crucial parts of the city. Uh, all of them with the details are, are assigned here. I won't get into detail, details of it, but that document, actually, we have it in the, um, in the package that you have. Uh, you can look at it uh, later on. Um, I just wanted to, you to uh, get a sense of what kind of uh, role that Mohammed Kaur was actually playing. Um, this one is uh, um, actually another one. Uh, the, uh, again, the goal is defined to prevent uh, the unrest and um, potential uh, counter security actions, meaning the activities of those who are in the forefront of the protest, the resistance units of the, uh, the MEK, all those who are actually, um, uh, you know, driving the, the protest or confronting the Revolutionary Guards, uh, they, uh, the IRGC command um, at Mohammed Corps are assigned uh, to confront them. Uh, so as I said, you know, every detail of that is, is mentioned and um, uh, you know, street by street and all the details. Um, then um, this is another one. This is uh, a week before that, um, dated October 28, 2022. Uh, again, it's urgent um, with top secret uh, uh, priority um, uh, uh, assigned by the um, commander of the IRGC, Mohammed Kor, Hassan Zadeh. And also um, it uh, basically details what actually they should do uh, in order to, uh, they say they want to show the prowess. You know, when you have these um, RGC forces, um, whether they're on motorbike or they just come as a large unit, uh, they say the goal is to create, to show the prowess, create fear, um, and, they, uh, and, and they go location by location. Um, and, and so that uh, task is, uh, is design, designed um, there. Uh, they also um, specify, this one is actually assigned to the uh, uh, Nasr uh, operational uh, command by the uh, Muhammad Rasulullah. Nasr was one of the four uh, areas of Tehran that operates under the Muhammad Corps. Uh, they also um, uh, mentioned that uh, when they arrest the people on the spot, they need to turn them over immediately uh, when they identify those who are in the forefront of uh, chanting slogans but also in the forefront of writing slogans to turn them over to the intelligence organization of the IRGC. So you can see the IRGC is involved in the suppression, is involved in the arrest of them, is involved in receiving those who have been arrested, and then the IRGC intelligence is actually controlling it. There are two major intelligence organizations uh, within the country, which is the Ministry of Intelligence and the um, um, IRGC intelligence organization. Uh, and of course, when it comes during the, the protests, it's the IRGC intelligence that basically takes over and dominates even over the Ministry of Intelligence. Um, so now let's talk about the budget because all of these activities that they're doing, especially in the height of the protests, needs money, needs resources, needs additional um, you know, augmentation of whatever they need and that's exactly what they were doing in the height of the protests, as the documentations uh, uh, show, that um, the, uh, uh, there have been demands for budget increase from all of the agencies that have been involved one way or the other in the suppression of the protests, whether it was the Revolutionary Guards, the IRGC, the state security forces, you had the Minister of Intelligence and Security, the MIS, the Interior Ministry, uh, the municipality of Tehran that controls the metro and all of the um, you know, key positions in Tehran, even the seminaries and the mullahs whose job is to uh, identify things and boost the morale 
of the, uh, the regime's forces, all of them have asked uh, for additional money and resources, and they've gotten it. And that's uh, one item that I want to get into um, details of it. Um, just to give you an idea, um, uh, we have uh, um, Mohammed Hossein Bagheri, who is the chief of staff of the uh, armed forces of the regime, who has asked for money. I'll get into the detail of it. Uh, we had the RGC Brigadier Ahmad Bahidi as an interior minister, uh, and then the, the uh, Ismail Khatib, the uh, uh, MIS um, chief uh, or the intelligence minister. Uh, the uh, seminaries, you have Hossein Salami as the commander of the Sarala uh, headquarters asking for resources, and then Hossein Ejad, which is his deputy, um, he basically runs the operation at Sarala Garrison during regular situation, but under the red alert, he operates under or on behalf of uh, Hossein Salami, and then the deputy minister of intelligence and some other um, holdings, I'll get into it. So that will give you a picture that it wasn't just one area or um, one agency, rather the entire uh, suppressive agencies have been, uh, been boosted with uh, additional money and resources. Um, this is Mohamed Baghiri uh, letter to Ibrahim Raisi. Um, as um, you can see here, uh, this letter basically uh, was dated November 24, 2022, again, at the height of the um, uprising. And um, it, it's a highly confidential letter written to Ibrahim Raisi. And um, he says, basically, the IRGC and the state security forces, they need the immediate budget uh, increase for cars, motorcycles, radio equipment, uniforms, individual equipment, and unavailable operational costs, uh, basically trying to boost the operation of these suppressive forces. Now, how much money has he asked for? $350 million. In one instance, Mohammed Baghari asking for $350 million uh, in the height of the uh, uprising, and he got it. Um, this is another example. Uh, Said Ismail Khatib, um, uh, the, as the head of the uh, you know, intelligence, uh, his letter to Ibrahim Raisi, um, again, um, um, asking for money and resources. The date is December 28, 2022. And um, again, it's a high, highly confidential letter um, uh, to Raisi. He says he needs money for missions, operational measures, technical equipment, uh, overtime, fuel, food, items and equipment used in dealing with riots, meaning suppression. You know, equipment that they want to, to kill people, to, to arrest them, and all of that. Uh, how much money has he asked for? A total of $41 million. There were two items, 34 and 7 a total of $41 million um, asked by the um, in, in, uh, intelligence minister. Here's another case. Uh, Hossein Nejat letter to Ibrahim Raisi um, asking for um, money and resources. Um, now, what does he want him for? Uh, first of all, the date is February 14, 2023, earlier this year. Um, he says he wants to prevent uh, any anti-security incidents, meaning the activities by the, you know, the, the youth or those who are confronting revolutionary guards, the, the uh, uh, resistance units, um, updating and renewing the closed circuit camera system, and then talks about face recognition cameras. So they want to install more face recognition cameras in various parts um, of, the, uh, of the city how much is asking for? Eight million dollars. Uh, with eight million dollars, you can get a lot of uh, cameras installed in the you know key locations, uh, which would have the capability of face recognition, not just the regular uh, cameras. Um, and and now um, this is um, Hossein Salami himself asking for increased budget. The letter is just you know a short while ago, May May 7, 2023. Um, again, highly confidential document asking for cultural activities for Sarah Allah Garrison. You know, when they have their, they're, they're done with asking for budget for everything else, they add uh, to it for cultural activities, meaning, you know, incentives, boosting their morale and all of that. How much is asking for? $78 million um, uh, that um, just earlier uh, this year in May. Um, 
And then um, Ahmad Bahidi, uh, the interior minister, the IRGC uh, veteran, uh, dated January 8, 2023, uh, a co highly confidential letter against seeking money for state security forces as soon as possible due to significance of the issue, uh, meaning that they, you know, they need the, the money urgently for that. How much they're asking for? $32 million um, for the uh, interior minister. Uh, now, um, in addition to all of that, the, the mullahs, the seminaries, uh, are also uh, granted additional funding. Um, here is the increase in the budget for the, the mullahs affiliated with the regime, $168 million. Um, uh, this was also uh, very recently um, sent. Now, uh, not only that, but those units of the um, state security forces or the IRGC that are involved in the suppression, they get rewarded when they do the, the killings, when they put down the revolt uh, here and there. This is one example that the uh, Qadir um, um, uh, holding company actually helping suppression of the regime protests. Of course, the funds come from the armed forces. The, armed, the fund is actually controlled uh, by them and then rewarding them, uh, basically showing that, um, rewarding them for, uh, uh, with $14,000 to the Armed Forces Social Security Organization for suppressing the October 18, 2022 protests in the uh, Asaluya economic region. Um, and that's a lot of money because $14,000 may not sound as big a number here, but remember the average salary in Iran is $7 a day. So it's like 20,000 days um, uh, of, of, of salary for, um, uh, for, 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 uh, for a worker. I'm sorry, 2,000 two, uh, two two times higher. <clears throat> so let me um, get back to where I started. Um, the Revolutionary Guards and how they actually uh, control and dominate the suppression of the, uh, the protests uh, in the country. Uh, how different agencies um, involved in the suppression are all operating under the command of the Sahara Law base. So we talk about the Revolutionary Guards. We are talking about a killing machine. Revolutionary Guards were built since day one to kill people, uh, to suppress dissent, and control the, the, uh, the, the population. And they have... Um, uh, not only done that, but also controlled the resources of the country in terms of the economy and, and, and everything else. But don't forget, most important than anything else, their main task is to kill people. And that's exactly how you could see during the, uh, uh, the, the, pro the protests. Um, now, <clears throat> one of the other documents that um, uh, was obtained uh, by a group called Qiyam uh, Sanaguni, meaning um, um, uh, uprising till overthrow uh, inside the country uh, from internal documents um, inside the country shows that there was actually extensive effort by the regime throughout this period over the past one year trying to confront the uh, opposition, the main organized opposition, the Mujahideen al um, by putting together um, uh, an, an effort, um, the gathering of various institutions from the Ministry of Intelligence to the uh, uh, Foreign Ministry, uh, the Judiciary and others uh, to figure out how they, sh they should draft a strategy to confront, specifically to confront the MEK. The main focus, the main target in all of these things is always the MEK. Just the same way as in summer of 1988, the main focus of the massacre was on the MEK based on a fatwa issued by then Supreme Leader Khomeini. The main focus of uh, repression is actually is to neutralize and to counter the MEK's resistance units. But interestingly, this internal document is very telling. The kind of uh, uh, you know, issues that they deal with uh, regarding the, um, the MEK. They say, this is their own analysis, that they say unlike the monarchists, the MEK, of course, they, they don't say MEK, I just put it in the printed the hyphen because they actually refer to what the, the word monafarin means, the hypocrites. That's the term, the derogatory term they use for the, uh, for the MEK. 
they say, unlike the monarchies, uh, the MEK have unity and coherent organizations. Uh, it, also, it, it also says that also the MEK have announced that they seek regime change by forming resistance units. Uh, this is actually the... Um, uh, <clears throat> and then um, in terms of the... Um, they, they also say that they are, the MEK are the only organization that has a plan to be the alternative. Um, they say the MEK are both uh, seeking to overthrow the system and are the alternative. These are all the words of the regime's, um, you know, uh, various agencies that they have uh, held joint sessions, joint meetings. Uh, they had six, at least uh, we have the report of six of those sessions that this is the result of that. And then they say the MEK possess uh, a network of influence and espionage within uh, the country. Um, it also says the MEK possess uh, a range of capabilities, including the ability to collect information. Uh, they have central leadership. They have economic power, and they have a social power. These are all views, assessment of the regime about the MEK. And it concludes uh, that this group can carry out armed operations. They have a strong motivation to fight. They have a history of fighting and resisting against the system. They possess significant information capabilities. And, uh, and it says, overall, this group is highly dangerous as a group aiming to overthrow the system. So they know where they're focusing on and where the, uh, the threat uh, is coming. Um, now, <clears throat> um, let me just wrap up um, what we discussed uh, uh, today. Um, basically, to prevent the recurrence of the uh, uprising, uh, the regime has significantly increased the budget and spending of various uh, repressive institutions. And um, the, uh, <clears throat> as we discussed earlier, uh, because the September 2022 uh, uprising basically spread to over 280 cities in all 31 provinces, and people have been chanting death to Khamenei, death to the dictator, death to the oppressor, be the Shah or the leader, and they have been basically calling for the overthrow of the Iranian regime. Um, so um, a year later, where do we stand? Actually, in reality, the conflict between the people and the regime has significantly uh, escalated. Uh, the divide is a lot deeper. Uh, the social situation is increasingly volatile, and the organized resistance, which is the key factor uh, in bringing about change in any country, specifically in the case of Iran, um, has actually escalated. Um, and despite the full-scale um, uh, suppression that I, we just discussed and showed the documents, uh, think about it, uh, how in the world that this um, uprising continued for months and continues to, to threaten the regime as we speak now, despite all of the measures, despite allocating the entirety of the Revolutionary Guards, the Ministry of Intelligence, and all the suppressive agencies, despite allocating all of the money and resources to them. You know, if you just simply add up those numbers that I showed you, just those that we have the documentations, I just did a, you know, a, a, a quick add up, that's over $700 million, almost three quarters of a billion dollars based on just those, you know, five or six documentations. Um, that's the amount of money that has gone um, to uh, suppress the, uh, Dissent, nevertheless, um, the um, resistance has been on the rise. Um, you know, just uh, a few months ago, the MEK announced that um, 3,626 members of their, the resistance units um, have been um, either arrested, killed, or involuntarily missing. Uh, but they said, in reality, uh, their uh, resistance units have uh, expanded both in terms of numbers but also in terms of uh, capabilities. No wonder that the regime had to create a special committee uh, within the different uh, interagencies to deal uh, with them. So uh, what, does, what does all of this mean? Uh, well, this means that every dollar that is given to the Iranian regime under any pretext, under any circumstances, is actually used um, and badly needed uh, by the regime and used for 
uh, suppressing the Iranian people, for funding terrorism, and for um, also developing their um, nuclear weapons. So um, appeasement, in one word, is, is counterproductive. It's immoral. And um, <clears throat> it's to the detriment of the people of Iran who have already rejected this regime and are constantly involved in the protests. And they want uh, a free Iran, a democratic Iran, a republic form of government rejecting any form of dictatorship. So um, what needs to be done? Um, well, they need the Western nations need to send a um, dossier of the human rights violations of the Iran regime to the UN Security Council. Um, we're uh, in, a, in a few days uh, where the UN General Assembly will meet. And uh, this is a, a timely situation that this issue is, um, is brought up there. Instead of uh, giving money to the Ayatollahs, you need to hold them accountable for their crimes, uh, including the uh, 1988 massacre of 30,000 political prisoners uh, in Iran. Um, we also need to um, see a snapback of uh, sanctions on the Iranian regime uh, to counter their nuclear defiance and their missile and you know, drone activities. Um, the Ayatollahs need to be expelled from all international bodies um, and um, shut down the regime's embassies um, or intersections, expelling their diplomats and uh, uh, their agents, and recognize the right of the people of Iran for resisting um, the Iranian regime, for the right to self-defense, uh, as stipulated the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and everywhere else. So the priority should be given to the people of Iran, not the Ayatollahs. Instead of focusing on uh, dialogue and rapprochement and giving concessions to the Ayatollahs, which would only make things worse, the focus should be how to side with the people of Iran, who have been very, very clear. Um, so um, that wraps up uh, this part of um, our presentation. I want to remind everyone that um, uh, just today we um, uh, released um, this report, um, and you have a copy of it here. It's Iran's uprising and the regime's dilemma, a, a regime of flame, a nation of flame for revolution um, that tells the story of the uprising. And uh, some of the information that we discuss here is actually presented um, here. So I'm going to go now to the um, uh, question and answer session. Please, um, everyone, uh, when you speak, uh, please speak to the microphone. It's available here. Introduce yourself uh, so that the audience uh, also um, uh, virtually can hear you. Uh, please, and then we'll go to John. Go ahead, please. Hi, uh, Farhad with the Voice of America Persian Service. Um, uh, what is the uh, NCRI's stance to the Biden administration uh, agreeing to unfreeze $6 billion of the Iranian money held in South Korea, uh, given the fact that your presentation was basically saying that with the money that the regime has, it ends up not in the hand of the people, but on the suppression of the people. So I just wanted to know, get your stance on this transaction. Thank you. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate that. Um, first of all, all of these transactions that um, is leading to the um, unfreezing or allowing, uh, providing uh, $6 billion to the Iran regime is done under the pretext of releasing uh, hostages. Um, let me be very clear that those hostages uh, should have never been held to begin with. Um, they should have been released long ago. Um, and the only way to get them released is by being firm and decisive. Hold the regime accountable for their crimes against humanity. Hold them accountable for their terrorism instead of rewarding it. So this whole policy of rewarding to get hostages back only begets more terrorism, begets more hostage taking. Look at the history in the past 30, 40 years. Uh, it's not a, a new thing. It dates back to uh, the 80s when the Iran regime were taking hostages in Lebanon and continued de dealing with various Western countries. And guess what? The regime got the, um, the money and the resources, got the, all the concessions that they wanted. Uh, the people of Iran pay the price, of course, for it. Um, that's how we got designated um, in 1997 and, and you know, afterwards. Um, but the, uh, the terrorism continued. The hostage taking became a very profitable business. So you don't want to make that a profitable business for the Ayatollahs. Um, 
And of course, um, under any pretext, even a single dollar uh, must not go to the uh, Iranian regime because it will end up um, in the coffers of the Revolutionary Guards. It's going to be used, as we showed the evidence today, uh, it's going to be used for suppressing the Iranian people, for funding terror, and um, the, um, uh, you know, in destabilizing the whole uh, region. Yes. Do you have any follow-up questions? Yes. John, please. Thank you very much, and thank you for the simulating presentation. Um, at one of the previous forums that you had, Senator Lieberman and Ambassador Bolton, I believe, focused on the uprising by women and pointed out that every one of the guards who are out there have wives, mothers, sisters, daughters who are probably going to voice their animosity toward this. And this would lead, hopefully, to desertions from the army or at the very least a refusal to punish the demonstrators. Uh, have you? This would obviously be a key, a pivotal element in the overthrow of the regime. Have you seen any signs of the desertion that is so important? Well, <coughs> uh, desertion within the um, military structure of uh, of the regime um, happens as a result of uh, you know they're being highly dissatisfied, but also. Um, feeling that they are under pressure. Desertion will never happen when you have rewards going to the Revolutionary Guards, people talking about, you know, dealing with the Revolutionary Guards, um, even considering any kind of future for the Revolutionary Guards or continued concessions to them. Um, obviously, um, as was the case in the time of the Shah, and, you know, we have had examples in other countries, uh, in order to facilitate the desertion, you, you need to show that the regime is in its back foot, that um, they are um, being uh, isolated by the um, outside world, but also confronted by the people inside the country. So I think the best way to uh, make those things um, happen um, is to do exactly the opposite of what the regime is trying to do. You saw in some of these documentations that a lot of money was allocated to the families and the individuals within the repressive forces in order to prevent desertion. So what you want to do, you want to go the, the opposite direction. You want to build pressure. You want to drain their resources and their money. You want to designate them. You want to make them pay the price. Desertion will only happen when those who are involved in repression are paying the price for it. And then the others will say, it's, it's time for us to jump the ship. Uh, not just, you know, securing their future, not just, you know, uh, giving concessions to them and all of that. And of course, and, and that's why we have been focusing on not just, you know, starting by desertion, but actually you start by building pressure on the regime. You start by confronting the Revolutionary Guards. You start by um, empowering the resistance units. Um, of the uh, revolutionary of, of the uh, of the people to confront the revolutionary guards, that's how this is going to happen, and of course this will happen in large numbers when we get to the later stages um, of the uh, of the overthrow. Well, well, we have questions of folks and journalists who are watching the event, the press conference online. Um, there's a three-part question from John Bowden from the Independent. Um, what is, the, what is the underground mood in the Iran's universities and colleges as the anniversary of Mahsa Amini's uh, murder approaches? The second part, how are the Iran's youth feeling about the successes and setbacks of their protests? And the last one, what kind of ramifications do you think the Amini demonstrations will have for the future of youth protests in the country? Let's start with the first part of the question. I hope I remember all the three parts. I'll come back to you if I didn't. Um, the, f the first part on the, in terms of the universities. Um, 
As you know, the universities have played a significant role um, over the years in the protest movement inside the country. It dates back to the time of the Shah when uh, the protests actually started from the universities. Major universities, the, uh, the most prestigious universities, uh, where the, um, the top RAS students were there, uh, became the, uh, the forefront of the protest that led to the downfall of the repressive Shah and the Sabak and its single party rule. And the same situation exists uh, here uh, under the mullahs in the early days after the revolution. Again, the universities were the bedrock of protests. That's why the regime, uh, Khomeini, had to order what he called uh, cultural revolution, meaning closing down all of the universities for nearly three years, um, in less than a year after the revolution, uh, trying to uh, purge the, um, uh, the staff, the faculty, the students, and appoint uh, pro-regime elements. Uh, even that didn't help, um, and you have seen their, their role um, in the past uh, year. Uh, so what um, I think uh, you can see in terms of the, uh, the students uh, that the uprising continues um, and the, you know, their protest continues in various uh, uh, cities and institutions. Nothing that the regime has done has actually helped. You saw a more recent uh, equivalent of that cultural revolution that started just two, three weeks ago that they have uh, dismissed and purged a number of professors and, um, and um, university students uh, to no avail. And that, uh, I think that is a clear indication that how troublesome the situation is actually uh, for the Iran regime. Now, the second part of the question, if you... Um, um, yes, how Iran, you feeling right now about the successes and setbacks of their protests in Iran? Well, uh, I think the, um, uh, you can see, and I mentioned earlier, from the reaction of the Iranian regime, you can gauge uh, the level of success and the impact of the, uh, uh, the uprising uh, since last year, and especially the organized resistance, the resistance units. When the regime allocates additional funding, when the regime allocates special sessions to try to figure out how to confront uh, the uprising, when the regime is unable to undermine the very root causes of the uprising that led to the protests in September uh, 2022, um, and is the main preoccupation uh, on the mind of the Ayatollahs and the Revolutionary Guards, and they're purging everybody, even intellectuals, that tells you it's all about success. Um, there is no setback um, in reality. Um, instead, you have, you learn th from experiences, you um, empower um, your capabilities. Um, you find out new ways to confront the revolutionary guards. Uh, remember, the pop Iranian population um, and the organized resistance are confronting the regime with all of its repressive um, um, uh, agencies involved with, with lots of money and resources, yet the regime has failed uh, to crush this, uh, this, uh, this movement. Uh, to the contrary, uh, the the divide has become deeper. The Iranian people are more determined now and more convinced today than they were last year that the only way to affect change in Iran is to overthrow the regime. Nothing else would matter until you actually overthrow the regime. That's why um, the, uh, that's you know, uh, the, the outcome of the past one year. And the third part of your question was, if you would repeat that, please. Well, you know, the overall ramification, let me just add one thing here, is that I think the outside world has a role to play. Um, it's very unfair to um, not only um, leave the population, um, you know, confronting the repressive forces, but also um, providing uh, money and resources to the repressive forces there. I think the outside world can play a significant role um, in um, um, you know, freezing the assets, in uh, drying up the resources of the regime, holding them accountable, making them pay for their, uh, their killings, for their terrorism. This way it will open up space 
uh, for the people. The people of Iran don't need money themselves. They don't need resources. They don't need boots on the ground. They don't need anything else except they need um, political support. And political support in reality means uh, squeezing their ruthless rulers and recognizing the right to stand up and to confront and to revolt against the regime. That's the most the outside world can do, and that role is a crucial role they can play. Okay, good. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. I want to thank everyone for uh, attending this, and we'll be available if uh, there's any one-on-one -on -one questions. Uh, we'll be more than happy. Thank you.